morning. Good morning. We have a few announcements for today. Beginning next week, worship will start at 9 a.m. for the summer. It'll be a little bit cooler, and we'll be starting the day a little bit earlier. So June 5th is when we're starting on the, at 9. Wednesday, this week, June 1st, is our first public theology at Gronsky's Milk House. So come and join us for ice cream and discussion. And that's in Highbridge at 6.30 p.m., so Wednesday the 1st. Eric has asked if we have any new or used potting soil for the large pots that we have outside of the planting. Uh, let him know if you can help out with that. And we're also looking for someone with a drone to be able to check the roofs and gutters. And again, that's Eric who's doing that work, so please be in touch with them. Next Sunday, the 5th, after worship, we're going to have cemetery cleanup across the street. Um, Pastor can talk a little bit more about the group that's coming to help us, so it's not only volunteers from the church, but a volunteer group from the county. And this Thursday, the 2nd, is the first carriage house learning event. So we'll be outside, um, bring a chair, and join us. It should be a nice evening. The topic, which will be for every Thursday in June, is what is church? So with that, I'll turn things over to Patsy. So they say you need to say something six times in a variety of ways when you're looking at it or reading it or hearing it before it sort of clicks with people. So just to reiterate, this Wednesday, Public Theology at Grodsky's at 6.30. <laughs> this Thursday, our first Carriage House Learning here at 7 o'clock, right outside um, in the Carriage House. And then, just to make sure we're hearing about Sunday. So we're meeting here at 9 for worship. Then at 10 o'clock, a group from the county is coming in, and we're going to be cleaning all the gravestones of the veterans across the street. So please think of this as an extended Memorial Day project, right? So, so what this means is you all have complete permission, you do every week, but you have complete permission to wear your grubby clothing to be digging out in the dirt, right? So, so you get to you get to be a little little more casual in church in order to go out there and do this good thing for the, the cemetery and honoring those those who, who served in our military. So, so the, the goal of this group that's going to be joining us is that by 2023. Every headstone of every vet, veteran, or not vet, every uh, yeah veteran in the country will be clean. That's that's the goal of this group. So uh, we're they, we're going to be partnering with them to to do the work out there. So please, uh, if you're able, come ready to uh, yeah get get a little little old grubby cleaning things up and doing a, a good thing. Um, so those are the, the three things. So if, I, if you show up at 10 o'clock, we're just going to send you out to the, the, the cemetery because 9 o'clock is when worship starts. So with that, please rise. <coughs> Hallelujah. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Hallelujah. In the beginning, before the beginning, there was only chaos and emptiness, no light, Literally no ground to stand upon, alone and without life. But God created all that is seen and unseen, and has declared good, light, a firm foundation, life. At the river's edge, Pharaoh's chariots hounded us. We were penned in, there was no escape. The seas are parted, we find ourselves safe on the other side. We are free. We are sore, working mightily for no pay. Away in a strange land, where can we turn? O oh, tired ones, eat what is good. Delight in the riches on offer. Turn to the Lord. It is claustrophobic. It is loud. The heat of the fiery furnace raises our blood pressure and adrenaline. <laughs> 
Find comfort. comfort. The Lord is with us. In the furnace with us. So that we will come out unharmed. Alleluia. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we have been buried with him by baptism into death. So that... And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so he too might walk in the newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection, resurrection like his. Alleluia! Christ is risen. Christ, Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia!
minds of your faithful people into your one will. Make us love what you command and desire what you promise, that amid all the changes of this world, our hearts may be fixed where true joy is found. Your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for the reading of God's Word. The first reading is from Acts. One day, as we were going to the place of prayer, we met a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners a great deal of money by fortune telling. While she followed Paul and us, she would cry out, These men are slaves of the Most High God, who proclaim you to a way of salvation. She kept doing this for many days. But Paul, very much annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I order you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. When they had brought them before the magistrates, they said, These men are disturbing our city. They are Jews and are advocating customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to adopt or observe. The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates had them stripped of their clothing and ordered them to be beaten with rods. After they had given them a severe flogging, they threw them into prison and ordered the jailer to keep them securely. Following these instructions, he put them in the innermost cell and fastened their feet in his arms. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was an earthquake, so violent that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer woke up and saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, since he supposed that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted in a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. The jailer called for lights, and rushing in, he fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them outside and said, Outside and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They answered, Believe on the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved you and your household. They spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. At the same hour of the night, he took them and washed their wounds. Then he and his entire family were baptized without delay. He brought them up into the house and set food before them. And he and his entire household rejoiced that he had become a believer in God. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.
beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes, so they will have the right to the tree of life and may enter the city by the gates. It is I, Jesus, who sent my angel to you with this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, Come, and let everyone who hears say, Come, and let everyone who is thirsty come. Let anyone who wishes take the water of life as a gift. The one who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all the saints. Amen. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.
So I, I had an idea of what I was going to preach today. It's going to be very straightforward. Right? It's just going to be a retelling of the story of Acts, emphasizing the aspects of the ancient world, so way back when, that needed to be unpacked for us to understand what, what exactly is going on in, in the book of Acts. Unfortunately, mo the modern world intervenes. I've had multiple people, members and non-members, come up to me in recent days and, and want to talk about the events of this week, and they've been so distressed, right? The revelations about the extensive sexual abuse in the Southern Baptist Convention has rocked some people's world. And the recent horrifying mass shootings in Buffalo and in Uvalde. And so multiple, as I said, multiple people just somewhat randomly have come up to me and asked, Pastor, is this the end? Pastor, is our wickedness too much for God? Pastor, is God going to destroy us for all of this? Right, so I couldn't just give you the nice sermon I, I had plotted and planned when, when this deep, abiding distress is upon the souls of so many people. So we're going to look at the story of Acts as a way to unpack not the ancient world of Paul's day, but our present moment. These worrisome events in the life of the world. Let us pray. Lord God, May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Lord God, may the preacher decrease that you might increase. Amen. Starting off in the book of Acts, we, we see this woman. She's an oracle, right? So she is respected for a connection to a certain spiritual something that allows her to either look at entrails of animals or enter into a trance state and then tell truths. One such truth is a repetitive description of Paul and Paul's companions. These men are slaves of the Most High God proclaiming salvation. Now this eventually gets a rise out of Paul because Paul is a bit of a temper on him. And he casts out the spirit and in so doing, Paul strips the mask off of her existence. Despite all the respect and all the nice words that people might say about the oracle, about this spiritual figure, she is ultimately a slave to men who are using her, in this case, using her for money. Once she was no longer useful, you'll notice in Acts, she disappears, and she's never seen again. Now I wish, I sincerely wish, I could describe this abuse as a relic of the past, right? Using spirituality and using religion to hide the use and the abuse of people. Using these things, these holy, sacred things, to gratify personal desires, and in many cases, get away with it. But we were reminded afresh this week that such wickedness continues. The independent report about the abuse in the Southern Baptist Convention found that the church body had engaged in a systematic cover-up of sexual abuse for the last 20 years. According to this report, now I can only get through the first 20-some pages of the 200-page report because it was a lot, right? So according to this report, the higher-ups claimed to have no way of tracking who might be an abuser, while at the same time they kept a secret list of more than 700 men they knew were abusers. The convention's president, Reverend Hunt, now stands accused of sexually assaulting his assisting minister's wife. Their publishing house was used to smear people who spoke out against abuse. Their caring conference for victims of sexual abuse 
was used to pump survivors for information to be used against them at a later date. The person in charge of investigating accusations of sexual misconduct against seminary students saw it as his duty to break down rape victims so that they wouldn't sue the church. And instead, he hoped, much like the oracle in Acts today, they would disappear, hopefully never to be seen again. Now I wish, I wish this was something wrong with just the Southern Baptists, right? And kind of chalk it up to some sort of odd particularity of their religion. But we know it's not. Right around 20 years ago, a similar report exposed the Roman Catholic Church as an abuse mill. And for that matter, this congregation itself has had at least one pastor removed for sexual misconduct. And you know, people from time to time ask me, Pastor, why are people your age and younger avoiding the church? Let's be real for a second. For millennials, since our teenage years, if not earlier, our eyes have been open to the reality that the beautiful high ideals expressed by religious institutions and spiritual organizations sometimes contain hidden agendas and sometimes contain things far worse than that. How could we not be skeptical of the church? Now, the response to this unmasking by Paul is swift and violent. First comes the accusation, hiding the prophet motive by ginning up prejudice. These outsiders, these Jews, these non-Romans, these people other than ourselves, the evil other, are trying to change who we are as Romans trying to replace us. They are irritant. They are an irritant. They are a pollutant. They must be punished. This is what the community at Philippi decides about Paul and his companions. And so Paul and his people are seized, dragged, stripped, beaten, flogged, and imprisoned. And then, after the earthquake, the violence continues with the jailer's fate for failure. He is likely a slave, seen as a device, a thing, not a human. You see, in the ancient world, slaves were often tied to prisoners as a primitive, low-jack device. So, this, this jailer was a device that failed. In the ancient world, when a person failed, the person is destroyed. The answer to failure in Roman honor shame culture, the only answer he could come to with the narrative and the story that his society had told him, was suicide. For him, there was no other way out. And again, I wish, I desperately wish, that normalized violence, casual violence, foundational violence, was the foundation only for the ancient order of Rome. But you can't tell that to any parent hiding their tears as they drive their children to school, well aware of the shooting in Valde, Texas, or to black folk in Buffalo and people of color around the country who are wondering, who have a sort of flinch reflex, if the next experience of bigotry they have will be one of deed and not of word only. Or even the shooters in these, these and many other cases, right? What hopeless, what evil messages have they internalized that make violence and death the only answer, right? Just like this jailer assumes the only out is suicide, so too the glory of the gun is the only way out. Somehow this is a message that they have, 
had accepted, have, have, have felt in their heart something about our society, right? Something about the world in which they live gives them these motivations and then the means to act upon it. Right, so that's a lot. This week has been a lot. I get why people have been coming to me saying, oh, right, it must be the end of the world. Or at least worrying that our wickedness has overflowed its normal balance. But you know what? These early Christians that we read about meet the powers and the principalities, prophet and prejudice, with proclamation and prayer. It's an earthquake. The message of the gospel and the prayers that interlace all their actions. Right? Because there gets to be this whole sort of back and forth thing people do about, ooh, just thoughts and prayers. Ooh. I'm doing something, right? But in fact, prayers ought to interlace every action we do, right? So it's an earthquake. The message of the gospel and the prayers that inter interlace all of Paul's actions. An earthquake that flips on its head everything about the culture they are in, everything about these folk in Philippi they are ministering to. Nothing looks the same in light of the good news and in light of aligning their will to the will of God. This woman who shouts that Paul is a slave, her own captivity is revealed. The men who used her, their intentions are unmasked. The only spirit they care about is their own greed. In their own desires. If nothing else, now she can see the world as it is. This jailer is saved by his own, by, pardon, the jailer is saved by his captains. Paul tells him a better story than the one of the glories of death, the story his society is telling him. Instead of jailer and prisoner, they become siblings. The jailer is washed in baptism and then washes Paul's wounds, wounds the jailer himself may have inflicted. Then a shared meal. You are no longer an object. You have a future. You have a place at the table. You are a member of God's family. Let's eat. Small, meaningful acts like these, that is the hallmark of the kingdom of God. Pastor, is this the end? Pastor, is our wickedness too much for God? Pastor, is God going to destroy us for all of this? Hold on to hope. God's good future is still being written. The resurrecting, redeeming power we find in Christ continues to call life out of death, goodness out of evil. Amen.
believers in the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, 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 the Father of the Almighty, maker of the heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, God from God. Set free from captivity to sin and death, we pray to the God of resurrection for the church, people in need, and all of creation. Holy God, make your people one as you and your Son are one. Extend the gifts we have been given by your Spirit to all people, especially those experiencing division or questioning your love. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Make worthy the work of scientists who look to the stars and planets as well as scientists who look to atoms and molecules. Bring innovation and well-being to humanity through their discoveries. God in your mercy, hear our prayer. Keep in our minds those who have died in war, both military and civilians. Especially Sammy, Daniel, Joshua, Marshall, Nicholas, Cooper, Justin, and Devin, who are certain in our country. May we honor them by seeking peaceful solutions to the conflicts that arise among nations and peoples. God, in your mercy. Your Lord. Grant freedom to all who are overwhelmed by chronic illness, depression, or constant worry, especially Lance, Erwin, Bill, Setzerfeld, Bonnie, Walter, Robert, Bill, Thomas, Millie, Bonnie, Ronnie, Eileen, Chuck, Philip, Paul, Mark, Justin, Heather, Frederick, Julia, Nadia, Bill, Isabella, Jen, Charlie, Mark, Brett, Carolyn, Argus, Doug, Donna, Ed, Larry, Ray, and Harley. Open them to receive help and salvation in Christ Jesus through the Spirit's gift of faith. God in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Stir our imagination and understanding throughout the church in the work of poets, theologians, and hymn writers. Like Jerry Janowski, who we commemorate today. Lead us into new visions and fresh expressions of your presence. God in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Unite us with the saints who have died and been raised in Jesus. Train us to wait with deeper longing for Christ to come again, even as we sense his presence with us now. Be with the victims and the families of the, vic of the individuals that have involved Texas and Buffalo, New York. God, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. In your mercy, O God, respond to these prayers and renew us by your life-giving spirit. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is indeed right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and ever living God. But chiefly, we are bound to praise you for the glorious resurrection of our Lord, for he is the true Passover Lamb who gave himself to take away our sin, who by his death has destroyed death, and by his rising has brought us to eternal life. And so with Mary Magdalene and Peter and all the witnesses of the resurrection, with earth and sea and all their creatures, and with angels and archangels, cherubim and seraphim, we praise your name and we join the running in here. Jesus Christ, our Lord, the body of Christ given 
for you. And the blood of Christ shed for you.
Thanks be to God. Hallelujah.